that is accessible and useful in a common ground. Uh, uh, yesterday, I gave something of an introduction uh, by looking at the Lucea in Madagascar. Um, and I said I, I did that um, partly so that we know what, what, what we're talking about people here. Um, and, and also to give you some sense of context of, uh, of, of ethnographic data. And, uh, and finally, I, I, I gave you some sense of uh, how uh, poor some um, presentations of hunter gatherers can, can be on, uh, in some public media. But this, the problem is made worse by, by the internet. Uh, for uh, Tuesday through Friday, we're going to be looking at a, a, a number of different areas of uh, the lives of hunting and gathering uh, people. Uh, and today, uh, I'll give uh, some of the theoretical background to the way that I approach this uh, subject, and then we'll start uh, talking about hunter-gatherer statistics, and what do hunter-gatherers do uh, when we talk about optimal foraging theory. Um, the, and then, uh, um, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, we'll move through a number of different <coughs> subjects. We'll have some more to say about foraging uh, theory, about mo mobility, uh, technology, food sharing, group size, and reproduction. And then on Friday, we look at some issues of social organization and division of labor and uh, the evolution of non egalitarian societies. When I um, first started working on uh, on the on the, the book that, that this comes comes from, I I didn't have much idea of why I was doing it, except I thought it would be a very good way for me to uh, educate myself about hunter gatherers. Uh, I started working on this in the late 1980s, and I was at that time I was telling people that my specialty was hunter gatherers, and I began to suspect as I started to teach in my first job that I really didn't know very much about hunter gatherers. So I said I, I, I have to learn more about hunter gatherers, and I decided that. Writing a book about them was the was the best way for me to teach myself about them. So I set about writing this this, this book, and I I remember my, my wife telling me, "What's what's the book going to be about?" And I said, "Well, it's going to be about hunter gatherers." And she said, "Well, yeah, what's it going to be about? What's what's the story? And what's the point?" And I said, "Well." The point will be for me to write down everything I know about hunter gatherers into one place. And then she said, that's, that's not enough point. That's, you have to get the story. So as I worked through the, the book, I, I, I left this subject, the evolution of non-egalitarian society, the evolution of stratified hunter gatherer societies. I, I left that to the end. Because at the time, I found it the least interesting part of, of the hunting and gathering life. And by the time I got to, to that portion of the, the, the book, the last part of the book, I realized that actually to understand that, to understand the evolution of non-egalitarian society, I needed to actually understand all of this material that came before me. So I didn't intend for the book to really build up to this, but that's in fact what, what it does. And that will happen in here too. Is we'll have all these pieces of information, and then when we come to the end, it, this is, you'll, you'll see all those pieces of information all come together to 
help us understand how egalitarian society might have evolved into non-egalitarian society. And, I, and the more I worked on this, the more I realized it's really a mystery how that comes to come about. Because <coughs> undergraduate societies have ways to keep themselves egalitarian to ensure that there is no social stratification. So it was, to me, it was something of a mystery how that could happen in our actual social mechanisms to keep them from, from happening. But I, I think I understand it now. It's not much of a mystery now to me. So to, today we have to start with some, some theoretical um, background. And, and, and some of this will be uh, something that many of you already know uh, about, but I, I want to make sure that we all have the same background to approach the rest of this material. And the, 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 the perspective that I take uh, is one that not all American anthropologists share, but it, it's, an, it's an evolutionary perspective. And many anthropologists, many American anthropologists today reject this perspective, um, but I think they mostly reject it because of uh, it sounds too much like 19th century social uh, evolution, which that's not what I'm talking about. Um, many anthropo American anthropologists are completely opposed to this perspective when the manuscript uh, for this book was sent out for review. The publisher sent it out for review. One of the reviewers sent it back with a very simple note on it. They said, "This, they said, uh, this, this book is so long that I can't even begin to write a review." <laughs> Thank you sincerely, and that was that was it. That was their whole review of the book. Uh, okay, well, everyone's entitled to their opinions. Right? Uh, so uh, we want to talk about uh, an, an evolutionary perspective. Okay? There are different evolutionary perspectives, uh, sort of one major category, but then there's a lot of different approaches to uh, a lot of different ways to take an evolutionary perspective <coughs> on a problem. Um, like this, or or this one, or, or this one, or this one, or this one, this one. Not <laughs> changing. This one, or this one. <laughs> Lots of different evolutionary perspectives. Um, but, but all of them uh, go back to uh, Darwin. And of course, Darwin's big idea uh, was uh, natural selection. But evolutionary mm -hmm. thinking had been around before Darwin and during Darwin's time. And there were actually other people, uh, notably uh, Wallace, who had basically the same I idea. In fact, it was first presented. Uh, Darwin first presented his idea in a paper that was co-authored with, with Wallace. Um, and there were actually a few others who had the same idea, but they didn't publish it in a big, beautifully written book like Darwin, so we remember Darwin and we forget all, all, the, all the others. And Darwin's idea is natural selection. For natural selection uh, to, to work, there has to be some something that's producing variation in population. And of course, Darwin is mostly interested in biology. He's not an anthropologist. And he's mostly interested in new species. How do new species evolve? And, and Darwin didn't know anything about genetics. Uh, actually, Mendel had been doing 
experiments with peas, and so someone knew something about uh, uh, genetics, but Darwin was not aware of that, of that, of that work. So we now know that there are mechanisms that produce variation in genetics, mutation of genes, recombination of genetic material, or within a population, the flow of genes into a population uh, via the flow of, of uh, organisms into that population. So natural selection works on variation because something has to be producing their variation. What natural selection then does is it takes that variation and it reduces it. It removes some of the, the, the variation. So we've got these two forces always at work here. Things that are producing variation and natural selection and other mechanisms that are reducing that vari variation. Genetic drift can be one of these. It's just random chance in the population. Uh, the, the given it's uh, an initial composition of different genes. Some of those will just be random chance throughout the life, and others will become more um, uh, predominant. And then there's <coughs> natural selection, which is uh, some, some genetic material is just being winnowed out. So there is this genetic variation that does not produce as many offspring or does not raise as many offspring to uh, reproductive uh, age. And it, uh, that has a genetic basis, and that genetic material is, is removed. It doesn't get passed on to the next uh, gen generation. <coughs> we probably all know that natural selection creates changes in genotypes and the genotypic frequencies in the population, but it does this by acting on the phenotype. And the, the phenotype is just the, uh, the manifestation of a genotype in a particular environment. And that's what natural selection <coughs> works on. So it changes the frequencies of genotypes through their expression in the uh, phenotype. Now, I, I, I've gone through all this, and yet, it really has doesn't have much to do with what we're going to talk about. Because we're talking about human behavior. And we're talking about human cultural behavior. And human cultural behaviors are not genetic. Lots of differences around the world in human uh, behaviors. <coughs> Those are not uh, genetic. And that's quite clearly the case because they're you know, if you uh, if I had taken a Finnish uh, baby and taken him to the United States, that uh, Finnish baby would grow up to be culturally American. They would like to watch American football, not uh, ice hockey. Not ice hockey. Not ice hockey. <laughs> Only in the northern states. Uh, and they would not uh, much enjoy uh, sound music. Americans do not enjoy sound music. Uh, so, uh, so for uh, humans, culture and technology are part of this, the, the phenotype. Phenom that's, that's what's being operated on. Not, not really genes. There is genetic selection that that goes on, we can see in things like skin color around the world, the body shape, and so on. That, that is happening, but at a, a purely biological level, not at a cultural level. <clears throat> but these same sorts of mechanisms are at work. Because when you look at evolution, you can define it a little more broadly. What evolution is, is the differential transmission of information over time. That information can be coded genetically. And that's what biological evolution is. But information is also encoded culturally in knowledge that's passed down not through genes, but by parents to child or from your, your peers. 
that's information. And there's always new sorts of cultural information being created, just independent invention. Somebody comes up with a new idea and introduces it to a population. Uh, different ideas can be put together to make something new. Uh, ideas can enter a population from another population through the internet or some other uh, me mechanism. There, there, are, there are parallels to be for cultural information. And like, likewise, there are variation reducing mechanisms. Uh, information can come into a population, but for purely random chance, some pieces of information don't get carried on to the next generation. And so certain kinds of cultural practices become more prevalent over time. In the same way, there are pieces of information that can enter a population, be introduced either through new ideas, like just independent invention, or information that's brought into a population from outside, but something can be action to decide whether that information is accepted or re rejected. Similar kinds of processes are, are happening. So we can look at evolution. It doesn't just mean genes. It really means information. The information can be encoded genes, or what, what we are interested in is the information that's encoded in cultural behavior. Why does that information change over time? A few more things to say about uh, evolution. One of the criticisms of, of <coughs> the sort of evolutionary pers perspective that I've been uh, given is we're assuming that the outcome, whatever the outcome is, is always the best thing that could happen. That's not true. Uh, and no one who studies evolution assumes that that's, that that's true. In the 19th century, they assumed that that, that was true, that evolution was always moving you to something better and better and better in an absolute sense. That's not necessarily true. Natural science works on the variation that's present. You can't work on information that's not there in a population, with biological or culture. It can only work with the variation that's present. Uh, so whatever is going to get selected, whatever is going to get passed on to the next generation, all depends on what's present for natural selection to work. That doesn't necessarily mean it's the best thing to do. And you can see this a lot in technologies. Uh, is it, uh, there was a competition there back in the 80s between VHS and data um, cassette players. Players, okay, these are just technologies all gone now, right? But um, VHS and data, and most engineers would have said that data was the better te technology, but it lost. That's that went went away. It was VHS that took over the the, the market. Why that is probably some interesting story of technology there, but it, it has nothing to do with which one was the best. And that'll happen repeatedly. Uh, the optimal is always relative to a situation with its particular constraints. So what's optimal in one context may not be optimal in another context. Nothing is absolutely the best. We never make that uh, assumption. It, it's all a matter of what the context uh, is. And there's always different kinds of selective pressures going on at the same time. So evolution is always a compromise between those various selective uh, pressures. An example is the, the peacock. The male peacock has a huge tail. We think, we think we can explain that, and we actually talk about that later. So it's an evolutionary principle called proxy signaling. But that's, a, that's an effort by males to sort of signal how good they are. What they're saying with that big, huge tail is, look, ladies, 
I can put all this energy into this big, huge tail, and it does me no harm. I must be really high quality. So pick me. Pick me. All right? At the same time, that big, huge tail, it, while it's doing one thing in the, in the sort of in terms of sexual selection, it, it can become problematic for a male turkey to actually run around with this big, huge, long tail on. It does cost them uh, uh, extra uh, energy. They have to invest energy in that in the after that tail. They have to drag it around, and quite frankly, it makes them easier to catch. So there's 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 always sort of a balance there. Evolution is always this balance between these different uh, selective uh, pressures. <coughs> This is where the social evolution is got it all wrong. And you may assume that evolution was always moving up, moving up, moving up, always getting better and better and better. People who study evolution don't make that assumption. And it's, it's wrong for some anthropologists to accuse us of making that assumption. We don't. We haven't made that assumption for centuries. And American anthropology, I'm always proud to point out, was founded by Franz Boas, and it was founded on the idea that 19th century evolutionism, <coughs> with all of its racism and sexism, was wrong. I'm proud of American anthropologists for that. So, what people who take evolutionary approaches like the one I will take here, are often accused of being sociobiologists. And uh, this is, um, we usually take this to be pretty ins insulting. Um, and calling me a sociobiologist, I will take it to be fighting, fighting words. Uh, because I don't consider myself a sociobiologist. Uh, sociobiology focuses on uh, inclusive fitness, something called inclusive fitness. And uh, inclusive fitness is a, uh, it's, it's, it's an important piece of uh, evolutionary change, especially biological uh, evolutionary change. It measures uh, how fit a, a species is in terms of its, its own reproductive fitness, which is their own biological offspring. And it's not just the number of offspring, but the number of offspring that are raised to reproductive age. If I have a lot of offspring, but none of them reach reproductive age, well, as far as evolution is concerned, what's the point? You didn't pass any genetic material down to the next gener generation. So it's it's the reproductive fitness measures how many biological offspring you raise to reproductive age, but it also measures the effects on uh, related offspring. So it might be the effect of my behavior on my brothers or my sisters' offspring, and whether I help raise those to reproductive age. Because those individuals, my brothers and my sisters, offspring, are carrying some of my genetic materials. That's probably 25%. Um, <coughs> so the perspective of sociobiology argues that behaviors are genetic. Or they might say that. The only significant behaviors are genetically controlled. They believe that culture, cultural information, they sort of treat as, as junk DNA. You know that we've got some DNA that appears to be just DNA, or at least we haven't figured out what that DNA really, really does. Uh, so it's not it's not important. It's just this sort of extra information that gets passed on. And what really matters are those behaviors that are biologically controlled, that are genetically uh, controlled. 
So they would argue that you can ignore <coughs> cultural information. Can you? Can you ignore the, the cultural aspect of, of, of human, human life? On the one hand, I might be tempted to say yes. And I might be tempted to say yes for this reason. And this, this is a subject that might be debatable here. But the humans are unique in the, in the world of organic life because we are cultural. Because we have different ideas about the proper things that people should do, what men should do, what women should do, what adults should do, what children should, should do. Different ideas about the supernatural. Uh, different ideas about how to govern our, our lives. All kinds of different ideas that, that are most certainly not biologically controlled. They're not genetically controlled. This is the whole subject matter of anthropology <coughs> is exactly the area of cultural behavior and cultural ideas. We don't know exactly when in human evolution humans became cultural in the way that we understand culture. Um, my best guess is it was certainly within the last 100,000 years. An anthropologist would like to push it back further than that, but I have reasons to think it was only in the last 100,000 years. And it wasn't true of all uh, human populations until I'd say about 50 to 60,000 years. In other words, it's in an evolutionary time, it's a fairly recent phenomenon. And I can tell you why I think that that's, that that's an assumption. But that capacity to be cultured must have a biological base. The, the capacity to be cultured, to have these sorts of different ideas in our heads, has to be biological. This doesn't mean that the different ideas are biological, but the capacity to have them is bi biological. And since all humans are equally cultural, all humans everywhere in the world are, are equally cultural, we all have the same capacity to be, to be cultural. It must have been something that gave some hominid, some human ancestor in the distant past, 50,000 years ago, 100,000 years ago, we're not sure. It gave those hominids a, 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 an, an, an edge in the, in the arena of natural selection. It gave them a competitive advantage over those hominids that were not cultural. And it must have been a pretty significant edge because cultural uh, uh, hominids with the capacity for cultural to Hominids with the capacity to be cultural quickly took over the world of humans. And those hominids that were not cultural dis disappeared from the face of the earth. So it has to have a very strong competitive advantage. It's what allowed humans to, to take over the entire world and to become today the dominant force in shaping the face of the, of the world. <clears throat> so the capacity to be cultural must be bi biological. Exactly what it is, we, we don't know. But it has to be something bi biological, something shifted in the wiring of the brain that allows us to be uh, cultural. It's what, it's what allows us to talk about things that don't exist. Uh, it is what allows us to think about the supernatural world. Uh, it's, 
So what allows us to do the real equation in equation two? And since it spread so rapidly and took over all, all humans today are, are, are cultural, it must have had a selective advantage to maximize the difference. It gave those hominids who were cultural had greater reproductive fitness than those who were not. And it's their genes carrying the capacity to be cultural which got passed on to the next generation. Those hominids who were not cultural, they lost. They didn't get to reproduce, they didn't raise offspring to reproductive age, they, they lost in that, uh, that competitive arena. So what sociobiology would tell you is that culture must therefore have some kind of um, reproductive benefits to them that has to be operated at some level. So does that mean sociobiology is correct? <clears throat> or does culture change? Does it make it completely different? Uh, this is one argument that once hominins, once humans, our ancestors became cultural, hmm, the rules of the game completely changed. Maybe. Culture entails two significant properties. One of these is social learning. We, we don't have to learn things on our, our, our own. We do. That does happen. But we don't have to. And we learn social. We learn by observing other people. Children do this more or less automatically. They, they simply look at what others are doing and that's what they that's what they, what they do. We're designed to learn this this way. And other animals do that also, but humans do it much more and much quicker. And in theory, we can keep doing it throughout our whole, our whole lives. We tend to slow down as you will. So there's a quantitative difference. We can learn stuff socially faster and enormous amounts of very, very quickly. Language, of course, is the best uh, example. Uh, and uh, I'm sitting here talking to a room full of at least bilingual, perhaps trilingual uh, uh, people. Um, that's all information that you learned uh, socially when you were very, very young. The second difference is that culture is symbolic. We operate in terms of of symbols. We operate in terms of things that take on meaning, that can stand for something that something for which that thing has no necessary relationship to it. You all see this in flags. <coughs> you look at a flag and you know it stands for Finland or the United States or any other uh, country. The only reason we can do that is because we're cultural. Where our brains are designed to accept things as uh, symbols. And we use this property every minute of every day. Looking at people in a room, looking at people walking down the street, you can tell something about people by their hairstyles, their clothing, the shoes that they're wearing, you can interpret something about them. Some of your interpretations will be wrong, but nonetheless, you're going to make those interpretations. We're designed to think symbolically. It's what allows language to work. There's no reason that the words I'm using should mean what they mean. I could just as 
I could be speaking in Finnish, not just as these words. That would be much better. Um, and, and so this this means that we can define uh, something as food or as not food. Uh, and it, it all it's symbolic. Uh, I, when I when I teach American students, I love to ask them the question. And I'll ask you the question. How many people here have eaten dogs? Probably half, but I'm not sure. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I've eaten dogs in my micronesia. Uh, or guinea, guinea pigs. Guinea pigs. No one else has eaten guinea pigs in Highland Highland End. Uh, snake. Can you believe it's snake? Uh, <coughs> come to Wyoming and we'll kill some rabbits and we'll try them up. It's really nice with a little bit of butter. Most of my students, when I tell them, you know, I've eaten jaw, they're absolutely disgusted. <laughs> or, oh, for Wyoming, this is the real catch. Ask students how many of you eat horse. Now, in France, you can buy horse. You can buy heels. Can you buy horse? Oh, yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Folks from Wyoming would consider you absolutely <laughs> savage. Horses are sacred. Or British also would do that. The British one. <laughs> they, would, they would really, really be disgusted. Disgusted the idea of eating horse. <laughs> Americans just think this is absolute. <laughs> this this that's the absolute last thing. At, at, you would eat people before you would eat horses. <laughs> horses are, are sacred. They're special animals. You do not eat uh, horses. Absolutely disgusting. The idea of French or I'm not talking to Finns. I think it looks disgusting. That's just defined as not food. There's actually Horses are perfectly edible, right? So is dog, snake. Uh, these things are all perfectly edible. You can eat them. But different cultures define different things as things you would not ever eat. That's, that's putting symbolic weight on something. You don't eat it simply because it's, it's, a, it's a symbol, simply because of the meaning it carries. Same thing can go with people who can be defined as mates or or preferred, but mates. We live in a patrilineal society. It doesn't matter how distantly related someone is to me, if they're in my lineage, that would be incest. They're off limits. On the other hand, my in a patrilineal society, my um, uh, father's uh, uh, my father's um, <coughs> sister's uh, daughter is probably a cross-cutter. cross, -cut. cross -cut is the preferred name. Even though she would be very closely related to my father, she might be a preferred she will be, she will not be a member of my name. Uh, so, so this this gives you know human information a, a different character uh, to it, and they can give evolutionary change uh, a character different from other uh, organisms. And this is because natural selection for humans is is acting on what some uh, evolutionary theorists call call means it's cultural behaviors uh, rather than on genes or genetically controlled uh, behaviors. So they, they, the behaviors we're interested in as anthropologists are cultural behaviors, behaviors that are not linked to someone's to someone's genes. Uh, so this can. This can give human 
cultural evolutionary change a, a very uh, distinctive char character. At the same time, though, since the capacity for culture is biological, there should be some kind of link to fitness in some fashion. So human cultural change has got two things happening to it. There's one the sort of fitness driven uh, 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 processes are still at work, but at the same time, there are these other purely cultural driven processes that are also at work. Sometimes they work together, and sometimes they work against one, one another. This is, this is one of the best examples here, something that um, a colleague of mine, Eric Smith, called the, uh, the yuppie fitness depression syndrome. Now, the word yuppie, is this familiar to you? Mm -hmm. Oh, it is, OK. Uh, young, uh, mobile, professional. You heard this a lot in the 1980s in the United States. You don't, you don't hear it so much uh, now. But, but it's, still, it's still true. And what the fitness depression syndrome is, is a recognition that up until the um, up until the 1970s, throughout most of the world, <coughs> wealthy families and wealthy countries had more offspring than poor families in poor countries. But by the 1970s and into the 1980s, that trend reversed. And wealthy families began having very few offspring. And wealthy countries, consequently, began having lower birth, birth rates. This has now resulted in some countries, Japan is one, France is another, where their, their actual growth rate is the, the intrinsic growth rate is going down. The only reason their population is growing is because of uh, uh, immigrants coming into the country. And they're actually concerned about this. Japan and France both have government programs that will pay you money, pay French couples money or pay Japanese couples money to have more than one child to at least reach uh, a replacement uh, rate. Still, it's not working. Here's money to have a kid. Uh, we, don't, you know, we, don't, we, don't, we don't want it. And this happened in the United States as, as well. People who were moving up, were making more and more money, the, the yuppies, uh, were not having children. They were postponing having offspring until well into their 30s, rather than having children very, very young. So, and this, this happened within my lifetime. I have eight brothers and sisters. It's a good family. But of those eight brothers and sisters, I have my wife and I adopted two children. I have a sister who has two children. And I have another sister with two children. So we go from this big family to each very, very small. So, and this is this is a worldwide trend that has sort of reversed a long, long trend in world in world history that wealthy families are having very few uh, offspring, partly by delaying reproduction and partly by simply deciding. Um, and of course, we have the the means now to control the family and son, just deciding if they're only going to have one or two children. That's it. Why? Why should that have shifted? Um, part of the explanation is culture. What do people consider necessary? People who are wealthy consider, they think that in order for a child to have a good chance of life, that child has to go to private schools, which 
cost money. Uh, that child has to have music lessons, which costs money. That child has to participate in different sports, several different sports, all of which cost, cost money. And that child is going to have to go to a very good university, which in the United States costs a lot of money. And you have to start saving for it. And the children are very small. So children, the wealthy people, children, are very, very expensive. Because of their vision, their cultural idea of what it takes to raise a child. A lot of money. So even if you're wealthy, you still look at a child and go, that child is going to cost me $300,000 to raise. Two children, $600,000. That's my income. Only two kids, no more than two kids. We can't afford more than two kids. Or one, or none. Uh, at the same time, we've got both men and women working. In the in yuppie families, the husband and wife are both employed. Uh, they never seem to think that they have enough, enough money. There's always a sense that they've got to move. <coughs> move up. And that's part of the culture. Um, the pressure upon them is if you're not moving up, then you're you're a failure. If you just stop at some level, uh, you're, that's a that constitutes a failure. You have to keep moving up and up and up. Uh, so husbands and wives both work. That makes it hard to raise a large family. My mother never worked outside the home. She worked a great deal. With nine kids, she worked very hard. Uh, but she didn't work outside the house for, for one. So, so we've got this odd, two different things operating here. You would think that people who control the most resources should be producing the most oxygen. And throughout much of human history, they did. And a number of people have demonstrated number of different historical trends. The wealthy people had lots of offspring. That's been completely reversed in today's world. Uh, the wealthy are having many fewer offspring. But that's a cultural process sort of colliding with a biological. So the two don't necessarily <coughs> work together. The specific evolutionary framework that I face is called human behavioral ecology, which I'll refer to as HBP. And we'll, we'll talk a little more in detail about that later after the break today. Uh, what's going to be the, the, the role of human behavioral ecology? Um, cultural evolutionary theory is not very well tested. And it remains quite uh, abstract. Uh, and testing, it turns out to be rather difficult to do. Um, <coughs> human behavioral ecology can play a particular role in this, in this process. It's, it's very concerned with the material consequences of choices. What, what happens um, when you make one decision about which foods you're going to eat, what men are going to do, what women are going to do, how frequently are we going to move around the landscape, we're thinking just about hunter-gatherers here, or what size group to live in, or whether you're uh, going to participate in trade or not, whether you're going to put a lot of time into preparing for an upcoming ritual, or if you're going to put that time into educating children. There's all kinds of choices that people have to make. We're going to focus on hunter gatherers <coughs> because those are the people I find interesting. Uh, but, but we could use this perspective on any kind of uh, society in the, in the world. So what 
human behavioral oncology is going to will do is it helps to uh, to set the stage for tests of, of evolutionary of cultural evolutionary theory. And why is that? This is the reason why. Uh, cultural information is going to be transferred in two major ways. It can be transferred vertically from parents to offspring, and it can be transmitted horizontally between members of a, of a, of a peer, peer group. Uh, or between adults through just diffusion of ideas between populations. This is potentially very important, these two mechanisms for transmitting information are potentially very important, and we'll, we'll come back to talk about this. So let me, let me just say very briefly, the <coughs> children can be raised in two major ways. One is they can, and those two major ways have names. One of them is peer, 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 your peers are your, your equal to us. Okay. Uh, and the other is not having <coughs> children. And this is, this is basically a, a horizontal transmission of information among peers and vertical transmission of information from adults to uh, ch children. Now, most children learn through some kind of mix. But in, in different populations, there's usually one of these sort of dominates of the other. And studies have shown that they, they create different kinds of habits. They create a different psychology. They create a different, a different culture. Or the potential for different major sets of of culture. For example, children who are peer reared <coughs> tend to be reared and spend lots of time in a, a peer group, a, a group of children all their same age. For some reason, they tend to develop uh, stronger ideas about uh, males and females. Stronger ideas about what boys do and what girls do. And it, it operates in odd ways. I remember when my son was very little, he was sitting on the floor playing with a, a toy school bus. And he just said to me, he said, school buses are toys for boys, not girls. Right? That's what he said to me. Right? And I was thinking, where did you get that idea? It's, it's as if they're trying to sort this this out, and in peer groups, for whatever reason, those tend to get sorted out more more strongly. There are things that boys do, things that girls do. Uh, social stratification becomes sorted out more more strongly. There's the idea is put into place that some people dominate other people. This apparently doesn't happen strongly in what are called adult year kids, where children mostly are spending their time with adults and learning from adults. It can create these very different, basic differences in the kind of adults that those children grow, grow into. These structures that transmit cultural information are affected by the choices that adults make, by how they spend their, their time. In, in our case, by choices, things like what foods are they going to collect out in that environment? How much time are they going to spend out hunting and gathering rather than doing something else? For example, spending time with, with, with offspring. Uh, so we can look at how these rather straightforward material choices can affect the transmission of cultural information from generation to gener generation. 
And if we change the structure of adult activities, foraging activities, the importance of rituals, the amount of time you devote to uh, pres prestige uh, act activities, all of those have an effect on what kind of information is transmitted and how that information is transmitted from generation to generation. And that has an effect on cultural evolutionary change. This is what I think human behavioral ecology is, a, it is an important and useful approach. This is the role it can play. Help us understand about where to spend their time and what effect does that have on the way that all <coughs> that information is transmitted from generation to generation. Does that, make, does that make sense? <coughs> well then, let's take a little break at that point. Can I see the penultimate uh, page or powerful structures? No, 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 sorry, the last one. Yeah, I didn't get the last one. Sorry. No, no, it's okay. Thank <laughs> you. 
Mutta ei se skula. Tästä on tullut se Hallo. Kuulko? Okay, so now we can, with that as a, a background, just a sort of general evolutionary framework, um, we can look a little more specifically at human behavioral ecology, HBE. Uh, and its definition is a very simple one. It's just the study of evolution and adaptive design in an ecological context. So it's uh, uh, it's a it's a field that was 
borrowed uh, by anthropologists from uh, the field of uh, evolutionary uh, ecology. And, and in fact, in the early writings, in the late 1970s, early 1980s, they referred to this as uh, evolutionary uh, ecology. And it was introduced to anthropology by two people, uh, Eric Smith and Bruce uh, Winterholm, uh, who were uh, graduate students, doctoral students, at Cornell University, in the Cornell University is in the state of New York, in the northeastern United States. And I've always considered this very, very interesting. Um, because when they were graduate students at Cornell, I, I was an undergraduate. I didn't know undergraduates and graduate students did not talk to one another at Cornell. I don't know why. Um, I wish I had known. Um, but I also know that since I was an undergraduate in that department, I find it quite strange that these two people came out of that department with this orientation. Because that anthropology department was uninterested in um, the evolutionary framework, in the evolutionary perspective. They didn't get it from anthropology. They got it from over in the department of uh, ecology. And they were interested in, in ecology because the, there was a theoretical framework used in the 1960s, 1950s, 1960s, into the 1970s, and it's called cultural ecology, which examined human behavior in an environmental context. So they were operating within that framework, and they wanted to know something more about ecology, about how ecological systems operate. So they went over to the Department of Ecology to take classes in ecology from <coughs> ecology. At the time, evolutionary ecology was that was the um, that was the sexy thing in, in ecology in that in that department. So they learned it over in the ecology department, not in the anthropology department, where they got their degrees. Uh, so they came out of this program with a perspective very different from that of their anthropology uh, department. They also were individuals who were interested in hunter-gatherer societies. Bruce Winterhalder did his field research. They're, they're not archaeologists, they're uh, 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 cultural. Bruce Winterhalder did his ethnographic field research with uh, the Cree people. The Cree in uh, eastern Canada. And um, Eric Smith worked with the <coughs> We worked with an Inuit group, <coughs> an Eskimo group, uh, near Hudson's Bay, also in, in Canada. <coughs> They're called the Inu Jubilees. Those of us, some, some anthropologists accuse me of uh, taking this approach to hunting gatherers um, because they say you assume that hunter gatherers are closer to nature, are more animal like than other 
humans like us. Uh, this is absolutely not true. The reason human behavioral ecology entered um, anthropology through the study of hunter gatherers is because the two people who brought it in, Eric Smith and Bruce Winterhalder, happened to work with hunter gatherers. It's a, it's a historical accident. And since that time, other people have taken this perspective of human behavioral ecology and have used it on other kinds of societies agricultural and pastoral societies, and even a few people have used it on uh, industrial societies, but I admit that's not that's not common. And it's the primary um, society, social form that's studied through human behavioral ecology is in fact up and down. It's not because I think those people are more like animals than we are. We're just as much animals as hunter gatherers. So I want to push that criticism uh, aside. Um, so very simply, this is what human behavioral ecology is trying to do, is to understand uh, the, the way in which evolutionary change operates in a specific uh, ecological context and how that produces the variation that we see around the world today. We will restrict ourselves to the variation within hunting and gathering societies, but we could look at the, everything in the world if we wanted to, if we had enough time. So we're interested in questions like, why do egalitarian societies, like uh, this group, this is the Atma in central Alaska, how did they, how did a group like this evolve into a group like the Nuchamis, also called the Nuka, on the western coast of, of Canada, into a non-egalitarian uh, social form? Uh, how does that, how does that happen? How does that arise? as an evolutionary process, or we to understand it as an evolutionary process occurring within a specific ecological <clears throat> context. So evolutionary ecology, which was the, <clears throat> it's the home of human behavioral uh, ecology, so what human behavioral ecology came out of is designed to unite an ecological perspective with an evolutionary perspective. To put those two together. And the, this, this work <coughs> began appearing in the 1960s. The first textbooks that are called evolutionary ecology appeared in the 1960s. Prior to that, you had some books about evolution, and you had some books about ecology, <laughs> the two had not been united, those two perspectives had not been united. Put together in the 1960s, Bruce Winterhalder and Eric Smith carried it over into anthropology where it simply took on a different, a different name and a little different character since we're dealing with cultural beings. The people who <coughs> practice human behavioral ecology tend to have um, one of two interests. There are some people who are interested with understanding the behavior of living foragers as uh, evidence <coughs> of evolutionary forces, as, as evidence of evolutionary processes. Now, I, I don't want you to think that that means we think when we look at the Micaea, those, the photos you saw yesterday, when you look at the Micaea, you are not looking, you are not looking back in time. You are not looking through a window onto the Stone Age. There was no Stone Age in Madagascar. So 
the Mikaya can't be a relic population left over from the Pleistocene. They can't. Um, they came on boats from Indonesia, from uh, Africa, fairly late in human history. So when I say that we're under, we, we want to use foragers to understand evolutionary forces, I don't mean that by studying living hunter-gatherers <coughs> that we're studying the past. I've been very, very adamant on this subject when talking with uh, uh, evolutionary psychologists who make this mistake all the time. Uh, who think you can study the past by studying living hunting and gathering peoples. You, can't, you cannot. If you want to study the past, you have to be an archaeologist. The only way. So but don't don't think that when I talk about hunter gatherers and evolutionary forces, I do not mean to imply that we're looking back in time. We're not. We're looking at people living today or in the very recent past. But our, our, our focus there is with understanding the differences among ethnographically known hunter gatherers as reflecting <coughs> the, the operation of evolutionary forces that are operating in different environment, natural environments, different social environments. That's, that's, that's what interests us. The other interest is, is with using the behavior of hunter-gatherers, of foragers. Does everyone know that I've used the word foragers and hunter-gatherers? I use those um, interchangeably. I don't think they're interchangeable. They are interchangeable. Yeah, they're, they're, they're the same thing. Okay. Just easier. <laughs> Forage is a little easier than hunter, hunter gathering. Um, so uh, there are other people who use living hunter gatherers as a way to understand some very ancient evolutionary forces that create some universes. For example, one of these. Um, is uh, the human females have the potential to have a long life after their reproductive years end. This is not true of other primates. In other primates, a female chick, for example, reaches the end of her, her reproductive years and she dies. This is not true for humans. Uh, women can reach the end of their reproductive years and still live quite a long time. And that's true of all, all females. So some research looks at that universal and is asking, well, how did that come about? And they study living hunter-gatherers to, to try and get some idea <coughs> about what were the selected forces that created this human universe. Uh, likewise, um, the long juvenile period of humans. Uh, we are juveniles for a relatively long, um, large percentage of our average lifespan. Not true for <coughs> other primates. So what, why is it? What produced it? What evolutionary forces produced it? My primary interest is in the first one. I'm interested in understanding the variation that we see in hunting and gathering societies. And how we're to understand how that variation is produced by evolutionary forces working in different environmental circumstances. Okay? Uh, there are other people, <coughs> if they can give a lecture to you, people like Kristen Hawks or Jim O'Connell, would be talking more about this, this side, um, this focus of human behavior ecology. I, I, I'm not going to focus on that. What are some of the characteristics of human behavioral ecology? Uh, it prides itself on following the scientific method. 
on proposing and testing uh, uh, Some uh, folks do that better than others, but that is always the, the aim of human behavior. Follow that classic hypothesis testing uh, approach. It has a strong emphasis on uh, empirical studies, um, collecting data um, and using it to then test uh, hypotheses. Um, many people who work in human behavioral ecology uh, do ethnographic work with various people around the world um, who still live at least partly by uh, foraging. They're active field programs with the Hadza in Tanzania, uh, with several of the, um, the pygmy groups in Central Africa, uh, in Congo and in the Central African Republic, and Cameroon, those of you like the Aka, um, the Baka, the Mbugi uh, pygmies. Uh, it's an active research program with the Pache in uh, Paraguay in uh, South, South America, also with the Simana in South, South America, with uh, uh, several uh, Australian groups, uh, the Magujada in the Western Desert, um, uh, with the Mirin uh, in Northern uh, Australia, with the Lamalera in uh, Indonesia, Several of the uh, uh, Inuit groups and, and Cree as, as well. Uh, and, and this this is a hallmark of human behavioral ecology. They, they, they go out, they collect data, and it's very difficult data to collect. Uh, they collect information on how much food comes into a camp. That's a very difficult thing. <coughs> piece of information to, to collect. Uh, it's very intrusive. Someone comes into camp and say, excuse me, stop. Before you go to her, let me weigh what she got here. And you saw the trouble that I had with the UK. They didn't want me to do that back at camp. I had to do that in the forest, which means I could only do it with the guy I was out with and not with guys who were elsewhere. They weren't going to let me weigh stuff back at, at camp. Uh, it's, it's annoying, it's difficult to do, but it's what has to be done if you want to make measurements of something as simple as how much food are men and women bringing into camp? How much food are children bringing into camp? How much food are women who are grandmothers bringing into camp as opposed to women who are mothers, as opposed to women who are not yet mothers? So you can sort all those data out and the people who do this kind of research do exactly uh, exactly that. Uh, and this sets it apart from some other uh, evolutionary uh, approaches, especially evolutionary psychology, which talks a lot about hunter-gatherers. But um, in my experience, knows very little about what hunter-gatherers <laughs> actually do. Um, it, it proceeds from some fairly simple models, models that are usually derived from microeconomics, uh, uh, and works from simple models to make some predictions about how people should behave if they're operating according to some set of principles. Now, of course, the first question you should ask is, what if those principles are wrong? If they're wrong, we'll discover that. Because we'll come up with a model, it'll make predictions about what people should be doing, and then we test the model against actual empirical data. And it's, it's right or it's, it's wrong. And sometimes they're right, and sometimes they're wrong. There's two. Uh, important elements to these <coughs> models that human behavioral ecologists use. And one of those elements is called methodological individuals. 
Sorry if those are really long words. Now, now you know how I feel when I look at finished words. <laughs> it's just this, I look at these words and I go, oh, forget it. I can't possibly even pronounce it. Uh, methodological individualism simply means that human behavioral ecology is focusing on what individuals are doing. It's less interested in these sorts of generic statements about uh, what people do in a society. And unfortunately, these are the sorts of statements that anthropologists collected <coughs> um, for many, many years. So uh, they might say something for a hunter-gatherer society. They might say, well, the men hunt and the women collect plants. And that sort of thing. And a human behavioral ecologist would want to know, do all men do the same amount of hunting? What about old men? What about young men? What about middle age? What about men with children as opposed to men without children? Uh, what about men who are considered by their society to have high prestige versus men who are considered to have low prestige? What, what do all these different sort of subsets of men do? Are they all doing exactly the same thing? Or are we losing a lot of information by just saying men hunt, women gather the time? We could ask the same questions about women. Do they all gather the same amount of time? What about women who are grandmothers? What about women who, are, uh, who don't have children? But you could ask the same questions. In, in order to answer those, you need information on specific individuals. So the method of human behavioral ecology when you're out doing field work, is to gather information on different individuals. You could then later um, class those individuals together, but you can do it in different ways. Old men, young men, men who are good hunters, men who are poor hunters, <coughs> men with children, men with action. You, you, you could classify them in different, different, different ways. But in order to do that, you need to have data on individuals. So we're going to focus on in individuals, options, and, and choices. And, and in here, when we talk about some information uh, from different different groups and different models, a, a lot of that information has been collected in ethnographic cases, individual by individual. So we, we may ultimately talk about groups of people but those groups are comprised of data collected on different individuals. <coughs> um, because every individual has got different options and different choices lying out there in front of them. And, and if, if we assume that the decisions people make about how to spend their time is somehow related to those options and choices, if you have to recognize that different individuals will make different different, different choices. Um, it, it assumes that there's a rational choice being made, a rational uh, economic uh, choice. At least that's the initial assumption. That's the assumption that goes into the construction of these simple models. In reality, nobody expects that assumption to really hold true. But it's an assumption that you make um, provision, initial, in order to construct a rather simple um, model. We think that those choices should be rational. When we say rational, we mean rational in an evolutionary sense. That those choices should be working to improve reproductive that's what they should be operating to achieve. That's that's the goal. Can I ask a thing? Yeah. This last thing that they should be rational in the evolutionary sense, just for people to productive practices, sort of 
Do you consider this like a conscious effort? No. No, you don't? No. Okay. I, I, I'll, I'll come back to that. I'm glad you asked the question. I'll get to that. Yeah. Um, and, and fitness here is, this is our definition of it. It's the propensity. Propensity. That's a funny matter. <laughs> I'm not like an English speaker. I mean, yeah, I don't know. know. <laughs> but I understand, I don't know if they understand. Uh, the propensity, the tendency Definitely. to survive and reproduce in a particularly <coughs> specified environment and pop population. It, it, it acknowledges that the specific environment, both a specific natural environment and a specific social environment, have an effect on what choices people are making that we assume are directed towards maximizing reproductive fitness. That's what lies at the, at the at the very bottom. And that's the goal because we're, we're operating within an evolutionary frame. So it has to come back to reproductive <clears throat> fitness in some way. But fitness can be very hard to measure. And when you're measuring individual by individual, there's all sorts of um, random elements that come, in, come into play. Um, and one has to sort of acknowledge this. So fitness becomes very hard to measure at that ethnographic scale, collecting data individual by uh, individual. So one way that we a proxy measure for it is uh, optimization analysis. And this is the second characteristic, the characteristic of uh, optimization. Optimization coming from the word optimum. Um, so when we talk about hunting and gathering, and, and we use optimal foraging models, we assume that when someone is hunting or gathering, that that individual is trying to perform at an optimal level. Is trying to perform at the most efficient level possible. Now exactly what that efficient level is can be affected by a lot of different uh, variables. Um, a, a woman who doesn't have a child on her back can um, dig tubers more efficiently than a woman who does have a child on her back. So it's, there's not just one optimal level, there are sort of different levels of, of optimal performance depending on the circumstances. But our assumption is going to be that someone is trying to perform, is, is trying to forge at the most efficient level possible. And that, that's a proxy measure of how well they're doing in terms of uh, reproductive fitness. So we're, we're taking that to be a proxy measure of reproductive fitness. Somebody who's operating at a very efficient level in foraging, we're assuming that that translates over into uh, optimal performance in uh, reproductive fitness. So that's going to be our, our sort of bridge between these, this sort of abstract principle, maximize reproductive fitness, and the real empirical data that can be uh, collected. Now, that said, we do have some cases, there's about five different cases, where, um, I'm sorry, you might ask yourself, is that true? If, if I'm a very efficient uh, hunter or a very efficient gatherer, is it true that I will maximize my reproductive fitness? It would be good if we could test that assumption so that we would feel comfortable using that proxy measure in other cases. And in fact, it has been tested in about five different um, hunter-gatherer <coughs> cases. 
where they have information on foraging behavior and they have information on how many uh, children those men and women raised to reproductive age. And they're able to show that, yes, indeed, those individuals who are very efficient at hunting and gathering raise more children to reproductive age than people who are not as efficient at hunting and gathering. The proxy measure seems to work. Does this all assume uh, intentionality? Yes, of course. However, the intention is not fitness maximization. No, no one goes out to hunt or to gather uh, berries <coughs> and says to themselves, uh, I'm going to maximize my fitness. No one says it. Not among other gatherers, not among you. Uh, no one says 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 this. Uh, nonetheless, we expect that that is um, that's what's driving the the, the, the behavior at some I suppose you might say it's a subconscious uh, level, and, and it's it's things that are. Those behaviors are ones that become culturally re rewarding. If you live in a hunting and gathering society, men are rewarded for being good hunters in lots of different different ways. Um, one is just simple prestige. Men simply acknowledge that he's a good hunter. And when we go hunting, we listen to what he says because he you knows what he's doing. He's a good hunter. The same thing happened with, with women who are good at gatherers. They acquire prestige through this. And that, that may be what people are really seeking. That may be their intention. I want men to respect me, so I'm going to put the time into learning how to become a good, a good hunter. And, and, and hunter-gatherers talk about this. Uh, you know, Australian men are classified as um, I've forgotten the Australian words, but one of them translates as men who are good for animal flesh. And that's what you want to be, a man who's good for animal flesh. And you don't want to be the other one, which is men who are rubbish for animal flesh. That's you don't want to be. Uh, so so that's, what, that's what men are really intending to do. But there's another side effect to that, which is what evolution is working on. Those behaviors that are rewarded, in this case, lead to maximization. In this case, the, the cultural behavior and the evolutionary forces are both operating in the same direction. When we talk about the yuppie case, they're operating in opposite. Um, it can be very hard to tell what the intention of a behavior is. Then uh, later on, we'll we'll another Wednesday or Thursday, we talk about sharing behavior. Men go out, they hunt the animals, they bring meat back. Are they bringing that meat back so that they can provision their family, give meat to their family, or are they bringing it back so that they can share it to the other family? And consequently, acquire prestige by doing doing so. What's their intention? It's hard to figure that out. And indeed, if, if you had the man and asked him, "What's your intention?" He he may not be able to tell you. But this is true for all all humans out there. This 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 way. We're sometimes not even sure what our intentions. Oh. 
one of the other criticisms of human behavioral ecology is that it expects a perfect world. It expects working with this optimization assumption. Our critics say, well, you expect everyone to operate at an optimal level. And they said, but you can, you can see that that's not true. That that doesn't happen for any given given case. We, that, that may be the beginning of a model, but we never expect everyone to operate exactly the same you know, as, as society. So does the optimization assumption mean that people always do the best thing and the same thing? No, absolutely not. Evolution works on existing variation. We said earlier today. And it, it works in two contexts, in two sorts of, of ways. The, one of these is called strategic, and one is called parametric. Don't, don't worry about the words. Uh, but there, it's referring to the fact that some uh, behaviors depend on the frequency of that behavior and the frequency of other behaviors in a population. So what I choose to, to do, how I choose to spend my time, depends in part on what other people are doing in that population. The other set of behaviors are those in which the consequences of the behavior always have a certain level of probability of success attached to them, but the consequences of that behavior are independent of what anyone else is doing in a population. Uh, let me let me give an example. Yeah. This, I think, is a good example. Yeah. It's not looking at a single population, but looking at two different hunter gatherer populations that have some different um, behaviors among, among the men. And a very fundamental difference between these two groups. This is the Ache in South America and the, the, the Aka pygmies in Central Africa. Very basic difference between them. Both, both of these groups have had some very um, carefully collected quantitative data on, on both of them. And, and we can demonstrate that among the Ache, men who are good hunters, who can go out and make a kill fairly quickly, they tend to stay out as long as possible and acquire as much meat as they can during the day. So they go out, they make a kill, ah, I've got a monkey, I could go back to camp, I've got plenty of meat here. But they don't. The men who are good at they keep going, looking for more animals to kill. And they're going to bring back as much as they possibly can in the daylight hours. It's different among the Aka. Among the Aka, there are also men who are good hunters, who are better hunters than other, other men. But they stay out only as long as it's necessary to acquire a minimum amount of meat. So they go out, make a kill. I've got the monkey or the little deep deep little forest uh, animal. And that's it. They go back to him. They go back home. An Ache man would look at him and go, this is a man who's rubbish for animal flesh. He's a good hunter. And he goes home after he makes a kill. No, you should keep going. Get as much meat as you possibly can. Why? Why is there a difference? Very simple difference in what's happening in the rest of their um, uh, environment. In this case, in their social uh, environment. The, uh, the Aka live really next door to uh, uh, Bantu uh, villages, uh, agricultural villages. And many Aka, this is true for many family groups, they're, they have a client patron 
relationship with the village. And uh, they, they act sometimes as hunters for the, the village, but they're always working with the, the village. The, in this particular case, they work so closely with villages that many pygmy women marry Bantu men. And they leave the pygmy village and go live in the, the Bantu villages. This creates a problem with the pygmy men. Because pygmy men cannot marry Bantu women. They cannot. The Bantu see themselves as here, and they see the pygmies as down here. This is a relationship that anthropologists refer to as hypergyny. Women can sort of marry into the higher status group, but women from the higher status group are not allowed to marry from the lower status group. Which means that pygmy men have a great deal of competition for wives. Because if you assume a 50 50 ratio, men to women, but some of the women are going to the fancy villages, then there's not enough women for them. So pygmy men have to compete for wives. How do they compete for wives? What do they have to do to get wives? What they have to do to get wives is to have lots of material goods, metal pots and clothing and other things that make them attractive to uh, women. They get those things by working for Bantu men. In some cases, are, I won't say that they're slaves, but they get locked into the relationship with the Bantu men. And they have to go work for him. And they're paid for these material goods that then make them attractive as uh, husbands to pygmy women. Because those are the only women that they can marry. So they have this other thing that they have to do with their time. So if a man is a good hunter, he can go out, make a kill, that's it. He's got enough food, he goes back to camp, and now he's going to go work for the Bantu village. That's where he spends his time. But now the balance, is it better to spend my time hunting more, or is it better to spend my time getting material goods by working for the Bantu, the material goods we have. They're more important than extra. For the Alche, they in a very different situation. They're not losing women to a, a neighboring uh, group. Just, just doesn't happen. For whatever reason, that's not their social situation. The Alche are like many other South American the groups, this practice is not meaning to the Ache, um, but the ethnographers tell us that Ache men use extra meat as a way to basically buy uh, extramarital sex. They hand over meat, give it sex in return. Common practice throughout uh, Amazon, exchange sex for, for meat. So these men are sort of maximizing their reproductive fitness. <coughs> by bringing in extra meat, which they're trading away for um, extramarital liaison sessions out in the bush. 